putting an end to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. I have a contention that the American leftist education system breaks kids. It doesn't build kids into good, solid, well-adjusted human beings. It breaks kids. You send your kids to school, in a, and I'm saying conservatives, you send your kids to school, they are adjusted, they you know, understand right from wrong, they understand consequences, uh, accountability, all these different lessons that you should learn by the time you're, say, 10 years old. And by the time these kids graduate high school, all of it's gone. It's out the window. Yeah, this, it makes sure that they they get broken. Probably, you know, in junior highs when they when they really put a just take that sledgehammer like Hillary Clinton did her blackberries and break the hard drive. And by the time they get out of high school, they're completely done in. Demoralized. Fish got to swim. Birds got to fly, but not with leftists. Everybody must move the same way. Can't have an animal with an advantage. Ergo, other animals having a disadvantage. Just can't have that. I mean, if everybody jumps in the water, the monkey's got to be able to swim as good as the, as the fish. If everybody's on land, the fish has to be able to perform like a leopard. That's just the way le- leftism works. It doesn't see that everything has its purpose. I mean, as silly as it sounds, and I know you guys are going to laugh at me, but something as lowly as a dung beetle has a purpose. All these animals in a, on a the Serengeti or some desert, some plain in Africa or elsewhere are going across the land and they're just dropping their dung. And here's a beetle. God saw it in his greatness to, to create a beetle that will take that dung, roll it up into balls and use it to, to, you know, to bring another generation of these beetles, but to clean the plains. And what's left leaves a a little barrier of fertilizer, because let me tell you, you don't want to, you don't want stuff that grows purely in dung. Oh, they'll tell you, well, it's compost. They got all kinds of cutesy names for it, but you want it to grow in soil that's been fertilized by taking some of the nutrients out of the, you know, the droppings and, you know, creating that ecosystem. But the dung beetle serves a purpose put a different way. And I'm certainly not calling these people dung beetles, but if you want to put it into terms of cleaning things up, like in an aquarium, you got that sucker fish, you know, or you got snails. They, they they're going down at the bottom of the ocean or the bottom of the aquarium in this case, And they are eating the excrement of the fish. And occasionally you got to take all the rocks out and clean it. But the snails keep it to where you don't have to do it as often. And those sucker fish. In in human terms, we have janitors. They clean up our dung. We have waste management professionals that clean up our dung. Plumbers that clean up our dung. These jobs aren't the greatest jobs in the world. They aren't the sexiest jobs out there. But they're good jobs. And they're necessary, but not for the left. For the left, nope, everything has to, you know, be the way everybody has to be equal. Or at least they tell you that. They want you to believe that. But they've got their janitors. They've got their housekeepers, their nannies, their pool boys, their lawn boys, and whatever else. And they rely on them. However, I can't tell you how many leftists I've heard talk about, uh, I need... You know, why are you going to send all the Mexicans back? Who's going to do our pools and who's going to do our lawns? It's like, really? Like that, that's the only people that can do that job. Who's going to clean the hotels? <laughs> Let me tell you something. You go overseas, go. I lived in China. It was Chinese people cleaning hotels. It wasn't black people. It wasn't Latinos. So what are they talking about? Anyway, they break these kids. There was an article that uh, talks about this even more because I, my contention is when it, by the time a kid graduates high school, they're broken, damaged goods, then they get to college. And by college, it's really too late. 
And Michael Barone wrote this of, of college. And he says in, a, in the 1989 article in New Republic, Andrew Sullivan made what he called a conservative case for gay marriage. Today, same-sex marriage is legal in Amer- everywhere in America, supported by majorities of voters and accepted as American life. Now, I'm going to stop there for a second and say I accept gay marriage, and I use my finger quotes on marriage, in the sense that gay people can be together. I don't care. But what I think the bigger point that he's making is we don't look at two gay people living together, certainly not like it was in the 60s. We've evolved as conservatives to say, I don't really care. He goes on to say this. Now Sullivan has cast his gaze on what he regards as a disturbing aspect of American life. The extension of speech suppression and identity politics from colleges and universities into the larger society. The hot house plant of campus moors have become invasive species, undermining and crowding out the beneficent flora of the larger free Democrat society. Sullivan can be seen as a kind of undercover spy on campuses to which he is invited often to speak because of his bona fides as a cultural reformer by those probably ignorant of the parenthetical conservative in his 1989 article. As Jonathan Rauch did in his 2004 book, Gay Marriage, Sullivan argued that same sex, by including those previously excluded, would strengthen rather than undermine family values and bourgeois domesticity. Now it seems like it's happening, he says. The spread of campus values to the larger society would and is intended to have the opposite effect. So he says, take the proliferation of campus speech codes. Americans of a certain age have trouble believing that colleges and universities have rules banning hurtful speech. They can remember when campuses were part of America, were the part of America most open to dissent. Now students are disciplined for handing out copies of the Constitution outside of a tiny, isolated free speech zone. The Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, known as FIRE, keeps a tally of campus speech restrictions and challenges codes and actions that violate the First Amendment in public institutions or private schools' own commitments. And in 2018, he list, they listed the 10 worst colleges for free speech, and they included Harvard, Northwestern, Fordham, the University of California, Berkeley. This is a big deal, folks. See, it used to be a campus would come up with these ideas because it allowed so much interaction and people to communicate. And in the in the way of gay marriage, and I'm using, you know, gays being together, I'm not going to call it marriage. But in terms of gays being together, I would tell you, maybe college did a good thing by saying, you know what, take the stigma off of it. It exists, blah, blah, blah. Now, I don't think they get to the heart of the matter. I don't think they get to the the other underlying issues regarding the creation of gaiety. Everybody wants you to bind to the notion that it's all, you know, it's it, they were all born this way. That's nonsense. They weren't. Many gays were made. Kids get their sexuality tested by older people. That's why even though we may look at a, a older woman you know, pursuing a younger man, you know, some of these teachers, 20 something year old teachers going after these teenage boys, we may look at it as kind of a joke. I personally have because I've seen some of these teachers and I said, you know, sign me up when I was a kid. But that doesn't apply to everybody. And it could have an impact on your sexuality. Not so much that you're going to be gay, but who you choose as a mate. It, it can influence you in that way. So in that respect, it's probably not a good thing. Certainly, I'd look at a 20 something or 30 something year old man dating a 15 year old high school girl is something wrong, even though that high school girl I've seen. I have went to school with some of these girls and went, wow, you know, I, I thought it makes me think back on this uh, teacher. I remember one of my uh, a girl who was a year younger than I was probably in like the eighth grade having an affair with an older uh, co- coach, one of the coaches. So. All, all I'm getting at is this. There are things that have evolved from college that are things that should make us think. Why should I interfere with how, however somebody wants to live and however that came about? I don't really have a care in the world, but I do care if the person was created and what let's go back and look at how that creation occurred. So if a little boy was molested and believes himself to be gay, but he's not. I think that we have to get to the underlying cur- you know, core of that. 
That's what I'm getting at. But if that didn't happen and he wanted to explore his sexuality in some way that uh, that disagrees with me, who am I to stop this person from enjoying life with another man, even though I don't agree with it? So maybe there was some good that came out of it. But there's a ton now that's bad because now if you say I disagree with the lifestyle, even though I don't care if they want to do, oh yeah, there you are, homophobic. If you disagree with anything these knuckleheads say, you're some type of phobic, and they want he to won't shut stop you down until he's the top-rated now radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive See, college is broke. Yeah. This is the Kevin Jackson it breaks radio our kids, show, and then it continues to break them into smaller and smaller pieces. What are we gonna do about it? I've got some answers. 